is the second lesson. Show by your good life and your good works that they are done with gentleness born of wisdom. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind in the universe, in all of creation, with the seas, with the land, with people. It's built in. It's a package deal. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy. He's describing his brother who is wisdom personified in the world. He's describing our Lord Jesus, who is in you, by the way. The wisdom from above is peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And then Jesus, in the Gospel lesson, picks up on wisdom and he does a, a minor slap down to the disciples who have delved away from wisdom into foolishness, like you and me, let's be honest. So let's listen to that story again. They must not have been walking with him, by the way. I, I was looking at this over and over and over because they must have been either in front of Jesus or behind him in this journey as they were going to Capernaum. And uh, they were discussing something they didn't want Jesus to hear, did they? Well, they were working, you know, several years already with Jesus teaching them. And he'd already reminded them that they are slow to remember things. And they were talking about what? Self-importance. Who is the greatest among us? They were saying to each other and arguing about it, see? You know, we see this in our culture all the time, maybe in ourselves. Well, who is number one? Yes. Who's the best? Who's the winner? And who's number two? Well, then you, you know, that's a long conversation. Well, then who's, yes, who's number three? And who gets to be number, you know, the last one, the unlucky one, the unhappy one, the loser? That's the foolishness of this world having to compare yourself to others and figure out, you know, who's the best? Who's number one? And they were looking for a criterion of some kind, some norm, you know, to help them understand who's the best. Was it Peter? He, after all, was boisterous. <laughs> we know some boisterous people. Um, well, he had at least ambition. When the others were silent, he spoke up, often too quickly, didn't he? And he had to backtrack. Was it Peter? Though he, he at least uh, was bold. Could be Peter. Oh, well, then they wondered, was it John, the beloved disciple? You know, these are all stories from the narratives of the Gospels that you know. John was called the beloved disciple. Well, even in da Vinci's uh, stunning painting of the very final uh, Last Supper, the beloved John is next to Jesus, and you could see the friendship in their eyes. Was it John? Was friendship the criteria that get to be number one in Jesus' list? Was it Philip? He was a great politician, by the way. He had political savvy. Well, you remember that day on the hill where there were lots of people that were hungry. Jesus was talking a long time. Uh, and they were getting hungry and they wanted to be fed. It was Philip who came to the rescue. Jesus, uh, I see you, you, you're not just teaching, you want to feed people physically as well. There's a boy here with what? I can't remember. Some fish and some bread. And Philip, was it political savvy? Is that what makes you number one, the greatest? Was it Judas, the money guy? You gotta have money. Was he number one? <laughs> We hear that by one of our presidential candidates, don't we? That that's the most important criteria, is God Almighty money. Could be Judas. Was it James, Jesus' brother? You know, blood relationship. Blood is thicker than water. Was it James? Well, they came to that house at Capernaum. I've been there. 
where they think the house is, Peter's mother-in-law. They uh, stayed there. It was a kind of bed and breakfast for them when they were up in Capernaum. And uh, they all got in the house, and they were silent. <laughs> well, they'd been jabbering about who's number one all along. But when Jesus came into the house, they were quiet, and Jesus asked them, what were you arguing about? They didn't look at him, did they? They didn't look up. This is just my little theory. I think they looked at their knees, like all of us do when we get caught doing something foolish. I remember that many times as camp director at the Boy Scout Reservation. For 10 years I worked there. I had to do a couple slap downs and uh, call them on the carpet. And you, you asked the question, Okay, boys, what were you doing at the commissary? Ah, oh, I think I know the answer. Uh, for my money, I think the disciples didn't look at him. And then he did this amazing thing. He went into the street where you could hear the sound of the children, like the beautiful sound of all these children. And he brought in a child, a little girl, Actually, the Greek is neuter. It could be boy or girl. I'm going to choose girl. He brought in a little girl, and he put it, her in the midst of them, and he lifted her in his arms. And can you imagine what the disciples were wondering? I mean, they had been surprised by Jesus before, so it wasn't brand new, but what now? A child. We've got important things to talk about. And you're bringing a street urchin with her snotty nose and her little puff of uncombed un uh, hair and her dirty feet and bringing her in the midst of us and I love what Jesus says let's see, we must hear it again he called the, the twelve he said to them whoever wants to be first must be last and servant of all then he took a child and put it among them and taking her in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes who? Me. The agent through whom creation was made. Oh, God the Father was the thinker of this. Jesus, according to scripture, was the agent. The Gospel of John. Nothing was made without Christ. The Logos the reason of God, and then the Holy Spirit was doing this wonderful, joyful dance and brooding over the whole thing. Whoever welcomes one such vulnerable person as a child and welcomes them as important as you are, welcomes the agent of all creation, welcomes God. And for my money, I think what Jesus is teaching us, isn't he? that there is something divine in all of us. I learned this in India, by the way. I knew it from studying before, but when I was in India, in the Lutheran church in South Andhra, India, full of Hindus and full of Lutherans in that portion, Muslims lived up north. I saw this at every meeting, on the street, people buying street food. A Hindu would come up to a Lutheran, Namaste, Namaste. You know what it means. The divine in me sees the divine in you. What did Jesus say? Whoever welcomes this child welcomes not just the child, but the divine. They welcome me. And they welcome the creator of all that there is, the whole universe. These are powerful words. Uh, it took a child for Jesus to teach them this. He was an excellent teacher. Um, and isn't the lesson here, the wisdom of God here, is that each one of us, and this is the gospel, aren't each one of us that little girl or that little boy, that little child, aren't we also the center of God's unconditional, marvelous love? And isn't that true, not just of Agnus Day and you sitting here, which it is true, but isn't it true of the young and the old, the gay, the straight, and the trans? Isn't it true of the rich and the poor, the native and the Asian, the black, brown, and white? Isn't it also true of the PhD and the mentally challenged? Yes. 
Is it true of the athlete and the physically challenged? Yes. Is it true of all of us? Equally important. The singers and the tone deaf. We got them all here. <laughs> we got all of us here. What Jesus is teaching about that child is also true of the whole universe. Every single person, no exceptions. And sometimes we get it, right? And sometimes even when we get it, we don't practice it. What did James, our Lord's brother, say? What is wisdom? Show by your life and your good works that are done by gentleness that you were born into wisdom. It's, it's more than thinking it. It's more than reflecting on it. It's actually living into it. And the gospel of this is that you and I make mistakes. That's all right. Uh, Jesus is being, the wisdom of God, Jesus incarnate, is being formed in you every single day. When you know it, and when you don't know it. When after a few hours you say, what was that conversation I had at you know, the Starbucks? Suddenly something about what she said is filling my heart with something very important. We don't know when the wild Holy Spirit, as we sang in the song, is doing her work around us and in us, challenging us, encouraging us, and so forth. And isn't this the promise, this wisdom of God, what Jesus talked about all the time, that you're always welcome, that I will never leave you, I love you too much. And isn't what he says at the very end at the Supper of the Lamb, when he says to the Father, here is your servant, the one you and I and the Holy Spirit have joyfully loved all these centuries since people were created and hands us back to the Father for our final nurturing and love in that place where nobody's asking, I wonder who the greatest one here is. <laughs> Not there. The Supper of the Lamb is the Supper of Love where everyone is equally loved. Isn't that what this is about? Isn't it? Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow has not yet come. Live into the wisdom of God that is already in you. Amen.